In this video, I'm going to talk about a song that actually needs no explanation whatsoever. It just sort of is what it is, without any real layers to it. But I do think I have some interesting things to say, so let's get on with it. The song I'm going to be looking at is by Country Joe and the Fish. It's called the I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die Rag, also known as the Fish Cheer. Also known as the Fuck Cheer when played live, when rather than shouting fish at the start of the song, as they do in the studio recording, they would spell out and then shout fuck which is very cool and mature and actually got them a television band back in 1968. He's a very naughty boy! So this song was originally recorded and released in 1965, but the version that appears on their 1967 album of the same name is much more famous. More famous still was their performance of the song at Woodstock in 1969. And it's one, two, three, what are we fighting for? So there are a few different versions, but it's mainly the 1967 studio version I'll be talking about. This track, for those who don't already know it, and if you don't, go listen to it now, is one of the most iconic sort of late 60s Vietnam songs out there. So I'm sure we all associate Creedence Clearwater Revival, The Doors, For What It's Worth by Buffalo Springfield, and the odd Jimi Hendrix song, as well as just a few of the late 60s, kind of early 70s tracks with the Vietnam War. Those kind of songs are used often in film and other media as a sort of shortcut to get across that Vietnam War vibe. This is the end. Most of those other songs and artists though, well, they're not just Vietnam songs or Vietnam artists, they're not solely cultural references to a specific historical moment or particular subculture. People listen to The Doors, you know, recreationally, for fun. Credence Clearwater Revival are also very popular generally. Country Joe's song, though, not so much, is much more particularly or even solely a Vietnam song. Like, it's not really much else. And the band are not really known beyond this song. Sure, they had bigger hits, or one bigger hit actually, but this is all that they are remembered for. So we're going to explore what makes this song so particular to its time and its context, what makes the song work, and some, some other, other third, third thing. thing. I like lists of three. So as I said at the start of this video, this song is sort of obvious. There's not really much to say in a way because it's just so blunt. There aren't many nuances to unpick. It doesn't have many layers of ambiguity or difficult to pass lyrics. The music is pretty straightforward too. But even that in itself is quite interesting, I think. This song is actually pretty unique in how utterly blunt it is. And even its bluntness, though obvious, is somewhat deceptive. So first things first, this song is a wild ride. It's messy, it's hyperactive. It's an oral assault, a barrage of instruments and noise. It's actually quite unpleasant. So what's going on musically then? Well, a lot, but also not very much. Harmonically straightforward, it's basically a very American sort of affair with a straightforward chord progression that you'll actually hear in a lot of ragtime music. If you understand what the circle of fifths is already, then it's that. And if you don't, well, basically, it's just a harmonic concept that organizes pitches and chords in a sequence of what we call perfect fifths. Uh? Basically, as an example, we could take the D and G chords, which are a fifth apart. G, A, B, C, D. One, two, three, four, five. So going from G to D, you're going up a fifth. And the circle of fifths just keeps going along with that. G to D, then D to A, to E, to B, to F sharp, to C sharp, etc. And you can go the other way as well, just by reversing the direction from G to C, to F, to B flat, to E flat, etc. Now, I'm not going to explain it all to you because that would take an entire video or in fact an entire series of videos or in fact just an analysis of the vast majority of Western music ever made, but basically it's just an extension of arguably the most important relationship in all of Western harmony, that of the dominant to the tonic. That is from the fifth to the root, D to G. D resolves to G. So this song basically just goes through the circle of fifths. We have the verse going from F to B flat, which is just the tonic chord to the fourth chord. And then at the end of every verse, we have a little circle of fifths turn around going back through G, C, F to B flat. 
And then the chorus does basically the same, but there's a little bit of added chromaticism. But generally, it just brings us back through the circle of fifths. And even that chromaticism is a very ragtime thing to do. And it's one, two, three, what are we fighting for? If the song were using the chords as they naturally appear in the key of F, i.e. diatonically, then we'd actually have a G minor. But they're all majors here, so that's what you want if you really want that true ragtime sound. It's a little less subtle, but what are you going to do? So the song just goes through this circle of fifths then. As a progression, it is, as the name implies, rather circular. It gives a nice bit of contained motion to the song and keeps it on a certain track in spite of the overall chaotic sound. So even on the level of the chord progression, we have something quite straightforward and pretty obviously suggestive of 19th century American music. I think these days, ragtime music's association is limited to kind of saloons, parlor music, steamboats, minstrel shows, <clears throat> um, things like that. And like this song, ragtime is very much, and maybe I'm being unfair here, I'm no expert, it's something of a dead genre, I think. It's not like when we think of ragtime, we think, oh, a contemporary genre that is still widely listened to and appreciated. I don't think it's anything more than a cultural reference to most of us, used mainly as background music in films and TV series, maybe occasionally used to set the scene in a radio play or something like that, maybe an audiobook. Heck, I'm sure you're likely to hear it at Disneyland or other theme parks or pretty much anywhere where a 19th century American vibe is likely to be invoked. That's all it is really to most of us. It's a meme. The baseline is similarly just something of a trope or cultural reference. It's basically just this all the way through. Root, fifth, root, fifth, move to the next chord, walk up, walk down. Simple stuff, and actually one of the most ubiquitous bass motifs. I hesitate to call it a motif. Maybe one of the most common and ubiquitous. Whatever, one of the most common bass line approaches out there that you will hear in loads of country, folk, pop, and rock. It's very popular. It also just feels a bit whimsical to me. You know, it has a little bounce to it. Simple stuff so far then, but it's the arrangement where things start to get a bit spicy. The personnel listing I found online is interesting. We have bass guitar, we have electric guitar, drums, vocals, mm -hmm, all normal so far. We have a wine rack, okay. Backing vocals, yeah, okay, that's fine. And we also have kazoo, barking, and calliope. Right. So let's start with the easiest stuff. We've already talked about the bass, electric guitar and drums are easy, vocals too. But then we come to barking. Barking is hardly a normal instrument to see listed, but we all know what it is. There are lots of weird little backing vocal shouts and yelps and things throughout the song, and they just add to the overall chaotic vibe, I think. It just sort of feels like more noise. We all also know what a wine rack is, though maybe we wouldn't expect to see it listed as an instrument. I'm honestly not sure what's going on with the wine rack. I assume someone's just hitting it and it's more percussion. Anyway, we also know what a kazoo is as well. Again, not necessarily expected, and I can't think of that many popular songs that use kazoos, though there are some. With the kazoo, I think we can safely add another instrument to the chaotic and maybe slightly obnoxious category. Indeed, the kazoo might in fact be the absolute epitome of chaotic and obnoxious. It's just an annoying children's instrument, right? We even get a few kazoo spotlight moments. Why, Joe? Why? No one asked for that. We didn't need that in our lives. While there is actually a good reason for all of this ridiculousness, we will get to that in a bit. The calliope, though, is where things get a little bit more interesting instrumentally. So what the hell is a calliope, you might ask? Well, if you didn't, I did. I had no idea what it was until I googled it for this. It's one of these. And it sounds like this. <laughs> Sort of nightmarish, huh? You can hear this quite clearly at certain points throughout the song, and just like the fish rag as a song has basically been relegated to a mere cultural reference, not a song that really exists as a piece of entertainment anymore, but as a piece of history. And just like ragtime, the genre where the song gets its chord progression from, has been as well, I think the calliope also occupies a similar space. 
It's not, let's say, a mainstream instrument. It's basically just another meme. Well, come on, General, let's move fast. Your big chance has come at last. Now, this is not the only popular song to use the calliope. The Beatles use one in Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite on Sgt. Pepper's. You can also hear one on King Crimson's In the Court of the Crimson King. Heck, even Kiss used one in one of their songs. But the point is that it's always being used as a reference, as a sort of invocation of a specific mood, time, and place. It brings to mind the circus, hence its use on Sgt. Pepper's, the carnivalesque 19th century American traveling freak shows, steamboats. It's basically a cultural relic of a lost time and not much else. So we basically have a very messy, chaotic performance using a few musical instruments and motifs that today are almost solely used as references to 19th century American music. And it's actually quite a simple piece of music. There's not much going on in a way, but in another way, everything seems to be happening at the same time. So the music is doing its thing and the lyrics, well, what are the lyrics doing? Straightforwardly, on a literal level, they're just exhorting the American public to either go off to fight and die, or send their children off to fight and die, to abandon everything other than their national pride, so their education, their offspring, their futures. Who needs them? And to sacrifice themselves on the altar of war. Alternatively, if you're a Wall Street banker, well, now's the time to make some money. And if you're a general, why, now it's your time to shine. Off to kill some commies. The lyrics are obviously satirical, but how do we know that they're satirical? After all, they're not entirely different from actual pro-war propaganda, as they share at least a few sentiments in common with genuinely nationalistic songs, like Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA, or Toby Keith's courtesy of The Red, White and Blue. Both of these songs are incredibly over the top and silly, but also serious. And then there's the almost impressively awful battle hymn of Lieutenant Collie, which is just bad. Just awful. So Country Joe and his fish are in a way just adopting the jingoistic language that they would have heard genuinely expressed at the time, right? And for the most part, there's no particularly obvious artistry to how they're saying it. They're just echoing or repeating verbatim anti-communist propaganda about the Reds, you know, and blowing them all up. Okay, so there is some artistry to it. After all, having a rhyme scheme, as this song does, is by definition artistry on some level. But just to be clear, it's hardly the most sophisticated or virtuosic display of artistry. The point is that it's affected. People don't just talk like that day to day, do they? Yeah, come on, all you big strong man. Uncle Sam needs your help again. He's got himself in a terrible jam. So rhyme can be a powerful literary and rhetorical tool, but it can also be a bit trite, a bit obvious or a bit childish. Sometimes less articulate songwriters and poets can feel obliged to rhyme and they end up forced into clunky constructs that they otherwise would have avoided. This song though, well, this song is both using rhyme in a rhetorically effective manner and being a bit trite about it. In this song, they are one and the same. So the first four lines in this song end in rhymes, or at least half rhymes, partly thanks to the accent that Joe sings in. We have strong men, help again, terrible jam, Vietnam. That's my terrible impression of his accent. Vietnam. Now to call the Vietnam War a terrible jam is clearly a little bit of an understatement. An understatement that, if taken seriously, could be read as an attempt to avoid responsibility for the reality of the situation. Of course, the song is deeply sarcastic. So what it actually does is point the finger at the US and say, this is what you do. You refuse to own up to the moral disaster that is the Vietnam War. And by using language about the big strong men of America and by invoking the figure of Uncle Sam, the song is showing an awareness of the sorts of pressures exerted on young men in the 60s to go fight in the war. The suggestion goes, you are strong men, aren't you? If you're not, you don't have to fight, I guess. You don't have to. This all happens in the first four lines. They're all linked together by rhyme and half rhyme, so Country Joe really leans into the trite, cliched side of jingoistic language from the very beginning. Every verse broadly does the same, deeply ironic lyrics that are nonetheless very similar to genuinely expressed patriotism and propaganda. All wrapped up in that sing-songy nursery rhyme scheme. Now, this is all obvious, but I'll still say it. The point here is that the rhyme scheme's triteness is still rhetorically effective because the thoughts they're representing, the thoughts some people actually have, are stupid and harmful. You might not have noticed, but it is actually a very sarcastic song. 
In my opinion, the most interesting use of rhyme in this song comes in the chorus. I can't actually work out what to call this type of rhyme, and I've been thinking about this for like years by now. Hey, I'm just slow, okay? So what it's doing is rhyming words with words that aren't there. Huh? So we have one, two, three, what are we fighting for? Five, six, seven, open up the pearly gates. Four completes the pattern we expect to hear in the count. One, two, three, four. Okay, so that one is just a straightforward homophone. But gates rhymes with eight, which is what we would expect to complete the next count. Five, six, seven, eight. So are those puns? That's probably the closest I've come to working out what to call them. But puns are technically A, jokes, and B, they play on the meaning of what's being said. But this doesn't truly do either. It's a satirical song, sure, but they're not jokes line by line. And there's no meaning to it, it's just completing an expected pattern. It's also kind of like Cockney rhyming slang, I think. In that Cockney rhyming slang, it isn't actually rhyming with something that's being said, but it's substituting a word and its meaning with another word that rhymes with it. So you have the dog and bone for telephone. It's a similar idea here in a way-ish, maybe? But it's not actually Cockney rhyming slang, is it? It's just sort of vaguely like it. Just like it's sort of, but not quite a pun. It's a Cockney rhyming pun from a bunch of Californians. It's wordplay. I might just have to leave it at that, to be honest. What matters is that you register even these not quite rhyming rhymes instinctively and they feel, again, a bit trite, a bit corny. And again, again, they follow a sort of nursery rhyme cadence while also being weird and actually quite interesting. And most importantly, they are subversive and they are sarcastic. So this song is basically just over the top, it's sarcastic and derisive. Great, huh? It does make me think though, have you ever heard of Poe's Law? It's the idea that, without a clear indication of the author's intent, every parody of extreme views can be mistaken for a sincere expression of the views being parodied. It's why, when I first heard Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA, I honestly assumed it was a satire. And I can actually still enjoy it on that level, even today, knowing it's serious, because it's indistinguishable to me from parody. I have the same attitude toward Courtesy of the Red, White and Blue by Toby Keith. I just can't not assume that it's satire. My brain, even when knowing that it is serious, refuses to accept that conclusion. These are the sort of songs that South Park parodied in Team America, and there's not that much difference between their send-ups and the real things. Freedom isn't free It calls folks like gay with me Anyway, why is all this relevant here? Well, I'd say that this song does not, cannot fall into the Poe's Law trap, simply because the music in this song, Fish Cheer, is part of that clear indication of the author's intent. It's basically shouting at us, oh hey, don't take these words seriously, we sound gleeful about all this stuff, but no, it's miserable, we hate it. Now, arguably, we don't really need the music to do that for us. I've already covered the sarcasm in the lyrics after all. And anyway, no serious or genuine pro-American propaganda would be quite so blatant as this song is, with lyrics like, whoopee, we're all gonna die, or be the first one on your block to have your son come home in a box. They're a little on the nose. We've basically got two counterweights holding the whole shoddy, poorly built contraption together. The whole thing is at risk of falling apart if you change that balance one little bit. If the music were more pleasant or less chaotic, maybe we had a catchy anthemic stadium rocker, or more melodic or pleasant but keeping the lyrics the same, well then, per Poe's law, it would be harder to distinguish it from a real expression of nationalism and warmongering. The music plays a big part in making the satire obvious. But if we kept the music the same and this time changed the lyrics by making them less in your face, blunt and heavy handed, so if the rhyming was less trite, the point a little more subtle or the language more poetic, well, then we'd have something else entirely. It could end up feeling like more of a parody of naive patriotism than a moral condemnation of the gross exploitation of patriotism by the ruling class. Or it would just end up missing the mark entirely. The musical tone just would not match the lyrics. We need both bits to make this song work as well as it does, which is a bit of a truism, but hey, that's what we're left with. Ultimately, this is just an all-round unpleasant song, isn't it? With its chaotic yet whimsical sound, trite yet sarcastic lyrics, the use of jingoistic language to subversive ends. And you know what? 
it's supposed to be. That ugliness works because it is a song about the Vietnam and the moral bankruptcy of the entire endeavor. It was absolutely hideous and messed up, and this song needs to match that. And this is why the song ends up being so particular to its time and its context. It fits that moment so well, and it was so biting a commentary on the Vietnam in particular, that it ends up being less relevant beyond that. Sure, many of the points can be used to criticise any war, but it's so obviously a product of late 60s Californian hippie culture that it simply sees fewer uses outside of its immediate context except as a reference to it. So as I said at the start of this video, you all already sort of knew that. You all sort of knew already that that's how this song works, right? You didn't really need me to point it out. And hey, some might even say that explaining the joke somewhat spoils it. Tough. But honestly, I don't think so. Explicitly decoding the references and tropes that our brains can automatically interpret for us can help us better understand what makes music work so well. Hopefully there's some value in me ruining the joke for you. Either way, I'm sure that you'll all agree with me when I say, well done Joe, you absolutely nailed it with this song, nightmarish though it may be. See you next time. <laughs>